On this episode, I talk with author Jake Knapp about his books, Make Time, that's his newest one, and Sprint. This is a really fun conversation. We discuss developing meaningful relationships, the many distractions we encounter on a daily basis, our phones and how to make them more useful and centering that around our productivity and much more. This is a really fun conversation for me. Might be my longest podcast episode. I really hope you enjoy it. All right, here we go. All right, today's guest is Jake Knapp. He is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Sprint, and he also spent 10 years at Google and Google Ventures where he created the design Sprint. He has since coached teams like Slack, Uber, 23andMe, Lego, and the New York Times on the method. And he's here today to talk about his brand new book, Make Time, How to Focus on What Matters Every Day. Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hey, Adam, thank you so much for, for having me. And for persisting through my technical difficulties here, I'm in the heart of the tech world in San Francisco, and we were barely able to make the internet work, but we did. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't know. I don't know. It's embarrassing. Uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> that that fiber, I, I, I've been wanting the oh, fiber yeah. here, and... Uh... And it's not. Looking yeah, you know. Right yeah, now, so. usually I'm I'm really crowing about the fiber and how great it is, but but when it didn't work, mm -hmm. it was well, it was inexplicable. Seems to be working now, so <laughs> we'll talk <Yeah>. fast. <laughs> That's great. Um, and, and then in the pre-interview, you know, I was asking you about the differences between launching this book and Sprint, and just because I have an audience, a lot of them either are going to launch books in the future, they're writing it now and going to launch them, or they want to write a book. And I just think experience is, is the number one teaching tool. And now that you've written two and, and launched those and done a bunch of other work, I think your insight would be valuable here. So how was it different? Uh, what did you do different this time that helped? Something you might do different next time? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. Now, I'll just start off by saying that I'm going to be really honest in answering these questions. <laughs> Great. And that's, that's not probably the right way to, <laughs> to sell <laughs> books because what I should be doing is telling you how I have everything figured out sure. and the book is a big success <laughs> and I'm perfectly happy with everything. And yeah. I should be saying that because that you know, I'm trying to convince people I know what I'm doing, so they'll they'll want to read the the words that I've written. But <laughs> instead, I'm going to be honest with you, and, uh, I love and it. honest truth is is going to be a little bit a little bit dirtier than that. Um, but the, I should should start off maybe by just quickly explaining what the two books are about, because I think that's helpful context. And the first book, Sprint, is about this method for teams to solve problems in five days. Uh, it's a it's a very structured process that I developed first at Google and then really perfected working at Google Ventures with all these different startups. And it's for this moment when a team is starting a big project. And I had found in my experience working first at Microsoft and then at Google that this was missing. Now, nobody really knew exactly how to start. And a lot of projects went off in the wrong direction or did, failed to start altogether because of this lack of a of good sort of opening. And so that's what the design sprint is all about. It's a way for, it's not really design dependent. It's any kind of team can use it to start solving a problem. And uh, writing that book, I had written a bunch of blog posts about the topic. People were running design sprints and we were talking about the work we were doing at Google Ventures. And that's, anyway, that's what that that book is is about. Stories about teams doing those sprints and it's a how-to guide for doing them. The new book, Make Time, is really for individuals. It's similar to the design sprint, which is about how to make the best use of your time as a team. The book Make Time is about how an individual can make the best use of their time and really our attention each day because our attention is in high demand. And yes. so my co-author, John, and I, who also worked with me on Sprint, we learned a bunch of things running these sprints with over 150 different companies. They're basically 150 experiments with people's work weeks. Hmm. And we started to apply some of these lessons to our own work. We started to blog about those lessons that, that we found and people reacted to it well. So we thought, well, let's try putting this into a book. We've written a book now. We kind of know how to do that. We think let's try to do that again. And so that's what make time is about. Make time is 
has just come out and, and it's, it's a different kind of an audience. It's a little bit different kind of a topic for us. So that's the, the preamble, right? So, yeah. So here we are today. It's, it's been out um, a, a month and, and yeah, I can kind of try to, to answer some of those, some of those questions for you. I, maybe some more context too, because I think that's important as well. Like I'm, I'm married with two young kids, run a couple of businesses, busy with other activities. Like what, where are you writing this book from? Married, single, kids, no kids. And I guess why make time for you personally? Was it, did you write it for yourself? I mean, obviously we all need more time. And, and of course it's a problem that we all face, but from that personal perspective to sit down and put, how long did it take you to write, make time? Yeah, it's, I had to make a significant amount of time <laughs> in, yeah, order to, right. in order to write it. Yeah, it's a big <laughs> right. project. It's a yeah. big project. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, it does have to be, I think if you're going to write a book, you have to feel pretty passionate about the topic because right. it is a long, long process. And so the motivation for writing Make Time came, for, so for me personally, and John and I each have, you know, we have different different stuff going on, but sure. uh, but for me, uh, I'm a... I'm a father of two kids, uh, two boys, age 15 and seven. And so I would say that for 15 years, since my, since my older son was born, I have been trying, my wife and I have been trying to figure out how to, how to, you know, make the best use of our time and figure out how, I mean, honestly, you, you know, you become a parent and you are trying to pay attention to these moments with your child. You're trying to figure out how to, how to do it. And yeah. America is a wonderful place in so many ways. One of the strengths of America is how flexible I think the how the culture can constantly change and adapt and and we were able to incorporate different ideas from different places mm-hmm. and create uh, many of our own new ones, but it's also challenging because of all those things because there's so much flux because things are constantly changing. And so if you're a parent, uh, especially I think you'll feel a lot of the pressures of our work society and the pressures of our culture, the changes, social media, the demands of technology that, that exist in our work for our time, even more acutely, because there's no, there's no sort of set obvious path for here's how to be a a great parent. Here's the things that we've passed on from sort of generation to generation that are still rules or, or guidelines that exist. Um, Everything could be sort of limitless. You could have your kids in an infinite number of activities. You could be doing your work 24 hours a day, responding to email constantly. How do you figure out what's right? How do you forge a path there? So it comes for me, it comes from that struggle initially, I think, which is an ongoing, it's obviously like an ongoing thing. I don't have, I don't have all the answers to that. I'm trying to figure it out every day. That's sort of the principle of make time is like, (laughs) Hey, here's a strategy for each day. As you Mm -hmm. try to figure this out over again, here's a strategy for it, you know, for each day. But also it comes from me from having things that I wanted to do that I felt like I was, I was putting off for someday. Like they were not ever quite happening. And I realized these two challenges, being the best father I can be and also paying attention to the projects that are the most important to me, they have a root problem, which is that it's hard to focus your attention. It's hard to actually figure out what's important at any given moment, what's the most important thing, and then let go of everything else. Yes. <laughs> That's so much easier said than done. That's such a battle. And so that was where the motivation for me to actually do all these experiments for myself, to try things myself came from. And my co-author, John, does not have kids. He and his wife are single. And for them, a lot of this motivation came from just being able to spend more meaningful time together to do his work in the best way that he could and to pursue for him also a, a sort of a someday project that he was putting off, he felt like forever, which was taking these long sailing trips and learning how to be really self-sufficient at sea. And so you'll hear in the book, our two perspectives, and sometimes we actually actively disagree on how to do things. And we sort of put that on the page. Um, but, uh, but you know, that's, that's kind of where the motivation comes from. And I just love the read it. Uh, it's really fun. Even the illustrations, I love the way it's presented. Uh, not so serious. And I mean, you yourself talking to you just for the little bit that I have, you come across as a really kind person. And, um, I mean, do you think some of the strategies, because we, 
we are all trying to make time and what comes along with that is stress, but you seem more relaxed than maybe most. Do you think the strategies, the research that you put in for the book has helped you get to a place of more relaxation? Were you ever like really stressed out in life? And did that play a part of, I'm really stressed. I need to find a way out of this or, or were you always, you saw what that did to people and didn't want any part of it. What would you say about that? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. I mean, you know, you always have to be a little skeptical of how anybody sounds on a podcast for better or for worse, you know, because it's a, it's an artificial environment. And I, I love having a conversation with somebody and we're talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So <laughs> I probably am going to sound more relaxed. Uh, but I, in general, I do think I have a better handle on the things that stress me out now than I did 15 years ago, 10 years sure. ago. Um, but you get me uh, the right time today, maybe even, or the, you know, the yeah. right time during the week. It's oh, a different yeah. story. I'm sure. not. I'm not in total Zen mode here all the time. <laughs> but maybe but it's San the, Francisco. I mean, it, I yeah, don't maybe there's. I don't, a, yeah, I don't know. I mean, God, San Francisco, wonderful place. I love it. I've lived here for about seven years, so it's not like I grew up here or anything. But I love it. But it could both chill you out and drive you insane. Definitely on any given day, like both of those things are equally possible, often within the same block. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so the genesis for this, I, I mean, I think, yeah, like when Luke was born, my older son, I remember going back to work and feeling like I need to, all, all of a sudden, like the day at work, I was like, I'm not with him. And I'm really early in my career and just kind of just struggling to figure out how to do my work at this point. So I was, I was 25 years old when Luke was born and and had not studied design or computer science in school. I studied art. Well, I was always like really into computers and had started just doing work in that field just because I had taught myself how to do it. I loved doing it, but I hadn't studied it. I always felt like I don't really know what's going on here, you know, and I have to learn and I have to kind of like catch up, like constant feeling of catch up. And I had started working at Microsoft where I was working on this team. We were, I worked on the Encarta Encyclopedia, which if you have any listeners who, you know, you have to be of a certain age to know what the Encarta Encyclopedia even was. It was uh, on CD-ROM, so it's a long time ago. But yeah. this is a team of people building <laughs> right. that product who had been doing it for a decade and really were like a well-oiled machine and knew their stuff. And I'm just like trying to figure out how to do it and and trying to figure out how to how to work with them and, and contribute. And so I did feel stress. and And I felt the stress of like, I want to make my work days really, I want to, I want to spend that time in a meaningful way because it's time that I now realize I'm missing out on this, on this other whole experience, this other lifetime. It wasn't like I was going to quit my job, you know, but I yeah. just realized time was passing, I guess. And that's a thing kids do for you. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I did come from a sense at first of wanting to be as productive as possible. And for years I was on this quest for productivity. And I think that we, try to be productive because productivity in the moment feels good. feels like I'm ticking off tasks. You know, I'm, I'm sort of cranking through things and there's this little sense of progress that comes from that. That's a good feeling and, and helping people when you work with people or, or, or people, your friends email you, whatever, getting back to people fast. It sort of feels good. There's a good feeling about that, but it took me a long time to realize that that was what I was hoping to get from that really in the big picture was some sort of sense of meaning or bigger progress. And it, it wasn't happening. No matter how fast I spun on the sort of productivity hamster wheel, it just yeah. kept spinning faster and faster. And, you know, you answer the emails faster and the emails come in faster. And you really, I was just reacting all along. And this, this took me a long time because I, I was at Microsoft for six years. I left there in 2007. I start working at Google. All of a sudden, it's even more intense. Everybody is even more like of an expert and stuff that I, I feel like, God, for all my time at Microsoft, I'm still behind. And, um, and I was really trying to learn how to keep up. The, the email volume at Google was crazy. Everybody's a computer scientist. And but a couple of years in, I was like teaching a class on email. I was working on the Gmail product as a designer and designing like new, new features for it and new designs. And, my, and it, I felt like I had it figured out. And I kind of then hit this wall all of a sudden where I realized, wait a second, like I'm at home with my kids. I'm checking email on my phone. I like it's a bottomless pit and I have to find a way to get back to the sort of original principles of being the best dad I can and, and making time meaningful. And 
being productive with all these little like life hacks, it's, that's not getting me there. That's so interesting you would say that because I've been feeling lately for a long time, I felt like building meaningful relationships and feeling like I was really productive could almost coincide. But lately, I've felt like they're battling each other. And so that's really interesting you would say that the thing getting in the way of building more meaningful relationships has been, quote unquote, productivity, whatever that means. And so I've really been trying to focus on that, figure that out. So I appreciate that you mentioned that because, yeah, I mean, I think we're all battling that. Yeah, productivity is kind of this this like little bag of candy that is in our email inbox. It's in our Facebook newsfeed. It's in Instagram and Twitter, and it's in checking the news, you know, and getting sort of the breaking news. What's what's new? What's happening there? It's everywhere. There's this feeling that if I do that thing, I if I check, if I get up to date, if I get caught up, then I'll be I'll be happy. Then I'll be doing what I should be doing, and perhaps then I can do what really matters. Mm-hmm. And the problem is that that you you maybe you get on top of one of those things, maybe you catch up on the news, and everything else is all the time piling up. And there's always going to be something new elsewhere. And, and the, and then the reality is that the, those, those never ending, those bottomless pits, like the candy that's there, it's just not, it's not really what I realized I was after. And, uh, and so I needed to figure out where the kitchen was, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and, and that's something that I think listeners can probably resonate with too. And, And thank you for sharing all that context, because not only is it relatable, but it's teachable too. So where are you at now as far as this is my last question about story and your journey and then we'll jump into your work but as far as your work are you out on your own do you work for a company and then if you are out on your own what was that transition like for you or are you still working for Google yeah so i i am on my own and the okay. the sort of end of that narrative i guess is i spent 5 years at Google first working on products like Gmail and um, I started this 20% project with some colleagues that became what's now Google Hangouts and Google Meet. So it's like a, like the video conferencing uh, tools that Google uh, has. Uh, but towards the end of my time at Google, I, I had created this design sprint process. I started just going from team to team, running this and helping them start new projects. And then I went to go work at Google Ventures where it's, you know, it's technically it's like a part of, it's another alphabet company. So we were sort of spending Google's money on startups, trying to make investments that would be financially, that would have a financial return. So trying to figure out then how to help these companies in the same way I had tried to help teams at Google with their new projects, trying to help these startups with their new businesses. And so I worked there for five years. And then last year, last spring, I left to write more books. And writing was, as I mentioned, there were some things I felt like I was putting off forever. And one of the big ones was writing. It's something that I always thought I really wanted to explore more. I wanted to do more, but had been putting off forever. And about, I guess it's about eight years ago now, when I kind of had this freak out about productivity has led me in the wrong direction. I need to rethink things. I started to make a really concerted effort to create time in my day to write. And what I was writing at first was this fiction. Uh, it's a like an adventure novel for, for kids. And I would work on that and sort of figured out how to make time to do that consistently and loved working on that project and worked on it for a few years and then kind of had a, the confidence built just from writing a lot of quantity, you know, of words, honestly, to once the design sprint stuff started working, I thought, oh, maybe the, I can make this into a book, you know, and and so that's where the sprint book came from, kind of from that foundation, actually, of this thing that was really a hobby. And then I kind of went back to writing fiction. And then when uh, John and I had been talking about this idea, we wrote this book. And that really writing this book was kind of part of the trigger of like, I want to do more writing. I think that doing it outside of, of work time is, is going to be challenging. So I don't want to wait forever and to see if that, if I had given more attention to that, what would happen? So I left my job at, at Google Ventures and Make Time is the first book that I wrote since being gone, but I'm working on a science fiction one right now and just going to kind of see how that goes. And then I'm also, I, I also coach teams on 
the sprint process and, and teach workshops on that as well. So that's kind of what my life looks like now. And we could, I mean, if you're interested, but I can go on and on about kind of how that transition has been and, and felt. Um, if and you've got the time, I do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, it's scary. I mean, working at... That's, that's really where I want to get at, at the heart of, because I think so many people find themselves in a day job they either want out of they, you know, and, and maybe not in your case, maybe you really loved it and you, you always wanted to go out on your own and was fulfilling that need. But there's a lot of people who are stuck in a day job they either don't enjoy or they've always wanted to go out on their own but don't see a way. And I just think that anybody who can speak life into that is really can really help people relate, give some doses of courage to and, and help them fight those fears that come with transitioning because I mean if we're honest we all have to pay our bills you know and and that's where a lot of the holding on to the day job happens so anything you can speak to that would I think would just really help tremendously absolutely well let's dig into it and break it down so for me first of all we can start with the paying the bills stuff because I think that I know that some people I have talked to have the assumption which turns out unfortunately to be false that because I had worked at, at Google for years and, and worked as a, in venture capital that I was sort of retiring, that I had so much money that I could do whatever <laughs> I want. And that really is not the case uh, sure. at all. So this idea of leaving, when I, I first you know, was starting to discuss it with my wife, it was really a matter of like, okay, can we, can we see a way to make it work for like six months as like a, you know, an experiment that could, like we could give it six months to see if it if we think it's working and even being able to sort of imagine and say like, okay, I think if this works out and that works out and that works out, then I think, and I think there's like a, a pretty high probability that, you know, basically that I could get this kind of a consulting project or that kind of a thing that we could imagine a way to make it work for six months before we were like, okay, we have to do something majorly different, which is like, we need to move out of San Francisco and I continue to not to be, you know, self-employed or we, or I, I take, you know, I look for another job or something and kind of say, ah, I couldn't, you know, make it work. But it was not anyway. I, I think it's important to preface it by saying that the paying the bills concern is very real for me. So I did not go into it with a perfect sort of head of steam there. Yeah. And that's and, the, and that's where context is really important. Married, children, yeah. you know, there, there's some sort of some things there when you're single, at least with me, I was a little more flexible, you know, as far as, as that's concerned. But when you bring a family into the mix, so that's why I wanted to start off and ask you about your journey and where you're coming from, too, is, is so people know that this guy has things going on that ties him to that. And he's still finding a way to do all of these things. Well, and I, I did also, I think never, I'm not in the situation where I always knew I wanted to be on my own. I gotcha. started off and I didn't really even know what I wanted to do. I mean, it's evidenced by the fact that I majored in painting in college and then kind of like <laughs> drop, I had to drop out of that and sure. find some way to, to scrap and get like a general art degree so that I would just have a have a degree, which I thought would be helpful because I was trying to get, you know, jobs in, in the real world. But like all along I did, I was kind of trying to figure out even what I wanted to do. And as a, even working as a product designer in software companies, I was never a great fit, which is part of why it's part of the genesis of this design sprint process and this kind of obsession with time and making the, the best use of it is me always feeling like an outsider and never mm-hmm. feel like I totally had it figured out. Mm-hmm. But one thing that always seemed clear to me for the first, you know, 15 years, well, maybe not that long, but of my career was this idea that working for a company who other people respect, who I respect as well, is like a really good path. And I, I don't know, I'm not sure where that came from. It definitely didn't come from my parents telling me that because they had had odd career paths. But I don't know, just like culturally, there were a lot of signals, especially when I went to work at Google in, in those days, at least, and people were like, oh, that's really great. Like you work at Google. That's really, that's exciting. That's cool. And it became the company that we work for can easily become a part of our identity. I think, yeah. especially in the United States, where often when you meet someone, one of the first things you'll say is, well, what do you do? And it's easy to get defined by that. So I didn't really analyze or recognize how deeply a part of my psyche that had become or my identity, like <laughs> that I'm a designer, that I work on 
this product or that I work for this company and with these kinds of whatever it was like that was part of me. And it was, um, when I started to recognize that it was like, it's kind of scary to think that that would become part of who I am. Like that's fairly limiting actually. So I guess one of the first things was just starting to say like, Hey, there's another me in here and I need to make sure I, I don't live my whole life as an appendage of this, of this other entity. Yeah. And I think that a part of it too is that I, in my career, felt like I constantly needed to switch things up as I started to gain capability in one thing and feel like, okay, this is working well. Then I wanted a new challenge. I think that's quite natural. People want, you know, challenges. And I found that at, at Google Ventures, after having, we sort of had perfected the design sprint process to the degree that we could while we were, while we were there and really working to build the reputation of the fund because it was a new thing uh, around the time when I started, it started a couple years before, but we were really trying to gain credibility with startups. This isn't going to be a thing. Google's just going to sort of lose interest in and stop investing in, which has been true of many Google products and, you know, founders were rightfully skeptical of taking money from us because you want the you want those people to be partners in your business for a long time and we had to prove that we were adding special value and that's kind of where the design sprint came in and then figuring out how to write that book and and tell that story those were big challenges but once i had passed those it started to feel like okay well this maybe the challenge isn't here anymore and then i was feeling this friction of google has become too much of my identity and i don't want to be putting off things that are really hard and scary and might fail, like writing, like working on my own. And it started to become clear to me that I, I wanted to try that. But it was not, I guess that was a really long rambly way of saying, it was not always clear to me that I wanted to do it. It wasn't like I was just like biding my time. And because of having a family and because of, you know, the requirements there, that it, that made it even all the more sensible that I would work for this company, you know. So that's kind of the background that led to making the decision to go. But there's a lot of angst involved in that final, like building up to pulling the trigger and doing it and those first months and year of doing it. You said that you always felt like an outsider. Do you think innovation, do you think you were more innovative because of that feeling? You said you almost used it to your advantage. I mean, have you seen the results of teams where you put them together and they might not fit? They might not feel that they fit, but they come up with, really good results? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, I suppose you need a combination of trust and respect, confidence in one another to have the best results. Uh, this is what I've observed. And so a lot of the structures that we would put in place when working with a team were, to, how do we make sure we give everybody the best chance to succeed? And just to give you like a small concrete example of this, we would Instead of having a group brainstorm where everybody's giving a sales pitch for their ideas, verbally having conversation, we would have each person put their solution on paper. So everybody's in silence. It's like really weird and awkward even. Like everybody in the room is silently writing down or, or you know sketching out or just putting detail behind, this is the way I would solve this problem. And then we, and nobody puts their name on it, but we then just look at what people have put, you know, put them up on the wall and just quietly look at them. So it's not the way a normal meeting would run at all. But this is, there's, there's a bunch of reasons for doing this. But one of the biggest ones is you build this sense of like trust and respect. And I'm not, there's no, um, there's no association with the person or a bias for or against their idea. It really comes down to the solution itself. And this ends up yielding a situation where people feel more comfortable expressing themselves. And where people realize, gosh, there's a lot more people on this team who can add something valuable to the conversation than maybe I realized. And that part is very important that you trust people, but having different perspectives is really important. And it was shocking to me in working with these teams that we'd see again and again, a great solution would come from a person who might normally not even be working on the product. For example, we would always try to involve someone from sales or customer support in the product development in this design sprint because they know the customer so well. And normally those people are not actually in the room when the software is designed or the service is designed. They're given the job at the end of dealing with the finished thing, you know, selling it or explaining it or helping people through it. And flipping that around a lot of times would yield a, an amazing insight, but you had to bring in that outside perspective. You get somebody who had expertise, but also fresh eyes. And I think that, you know, if I was going to try to look at my own career in technology through the most forgiving light on me, I would say like, yeah, probably the, 
the thing that I was really good at was keeping that outsider's perspective. And then as I gained expertise, being able to use it well, but it's very hard to stay an outsider. You very quickly become an insider. You very quickly drink the Kool-Aid and stop seeing the things that are obvious flaws that you notice on day one. So I, I wasn't always great at that, but to the extent that I had success, I think a lot of it came from being an outsider. It's a really good reminder what to look for, even when you're hiring somebody, um, to make sure to think about the team that you already have and how they will fit. And if they don't fit, there's still a chance that it could work and work in really cool ways if you allow it to. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I want to jump into your book because there's one idea that I found really useful. I implemented right away, and it has to do with how you talk about the home screen on your phone taking all the apps away. And I just, I love it. I've, I've been using it for a few weeks now since reading the book and it has helped me tremendously. And, and what I found really interesting is, is you've helped design apps and this is coming from someone who helped design them. And I just wanted to talk to you about, I mean, my phone is the number one thing taking time, either an email or an app or, you know, social media. And I've talked to previous guests about this as well, but someone who actually designed it, I don't know if you had anything to do with Google Plus, uh, and I heard that that's that's going away. But <laughs> I would like um, to point out that the one thing that I had anything to do with that was in Google Plus, which was Google Hangouts, still exists because hey. <laughs> it was actually a good product. I won't. I don't want to throw. I don't want to throw Google under the bus, but sure. I think the good stuff is still around. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about their, that too. Not their you... finest moment, but yeah, that's probably a whole nother podcast. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Luckily, that was when I was working at Google Ventures when all that came out and gotcha. dropped and fizzled. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it never turned into what I, I think they hoped it would. But uh, I'm not sure they even knew what they wanted it to be. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> the truth comes out. But it didn't, but whatever it was, you're right. It didn't have, I'm sure that's not what they had in mind. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I mean, just from designing apps to saying, get rid of them, like what's your perspective on our phones, our apps? And would you agree that it's our number one time waste in 2018 as we're talking? This could be a lengthy conversation. You don't have to spend a ton of time here, but that point in the book has made me feel better, less overwhelmed. I'm using certain apps less that I used to use more just because they're harder to get to. I can't remember if there's research around that, but it, it sure has helped me there. And then, you know, should we be leaving our smartphones at home more often? Do you set your phone to a certain mode to help you? Yeah, I mean, it's a lot of questions surrounding that. But um, but yeah, going back to our conversation, productivity getting in the way of meaningful relationships, maybe that's the wrong way to put it. Maybe it's just the way I have my habits, my system set up. I probably just need to go back to the habits and systems that I have set up and change them to help fit the things that I truly want to do. But your take on that. Well, yeah. So, I mean, this is, you'll probably have to stop me at some point because this is a topic <laughs> that I'm super fascinated by and, and interested Ob in. Obviously with, with the book. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, you spend a lot of time. And on I that, love so. to get the chance to talk about it on a podcast like this because it's a it takes a bit of nuance to talk about it. And what you hear about in the press are the most extreme opinions because that's all we have time for most of the time is the extreme opinions. And that's part of the reason why it's, I think we continue to struggle is that the extreme opinions serve a purpose on this. And what I'm talking about with extreme opinions are people who say the tech companies are hijacking our brains and like the stuff is just bad and we need to, yeah, they need to take responsibility and, or they need to be regulated by the government. Like, and this is a valuable conversation and bringing the topic up is super important, but mm -hmm. that tends to be all that we hear and it's very extreme and it is not actually helpful to us as individuals. So my perspective on it is a, bit more nuanced, which means a lot of times people are like, well, that's not extreme enough to, <laughs> to really catch my attention. But now that we've got people locked in their headphones, hopefully uh, I can, I can hopefully tell the story in a bit of a, I think is an interesting way. And I actually, I think it's worth looking at the last, like zooming out for a second and looking at like the last sort of 12 years or 15 years, what's happened in technology. Because if you go back to 2006, 2007, so the iPhone comes out in 2007, 
And before that, you've got Blackberries. Like, so a, a bunch of people are on Blackberries, but not everybody. It's not like today where everybody has a smartphone. But they were problematic for people even at that time. I, I never had one, but like I could see what was going on with people who had them, and it was kind of crazy. You could actually see a bit more like how dependent people would become on them and how you know it was just this like, sort of like nonstop thing. But if you look at that time before, but really the, you know, the iPhone is the big turning of the tide and like everything mm -hmm. starts to take off after the iPhone comes out. That's when you get smartphones eventually just being everywhere. And if you look at the time before that, what's interesting to me is like a lot of like work was happening back then. Like we were able to do yeah. complicated things. Yeah. I mean, Google started before smartphones. Like they made Google from nothing bef without iPhones. Like they didn't have iPhones or Android phones. Like they, they weren't able to check email from any location on the earth you know, and those guys were able to start Google. Mm. Uh, they were able to start Facebook from nothing without smartphones. We, I mean, and like, you know, you could, you could sort of see my point and we could go on and yeah. on, but like they built the Saturn rockets and sent the Apollo missions to the moon, like without smartphones. Like dude, humans are able to do incredible endeavors without smartphones. So there's nothing actually that changed about work getting harder or the things that we're doing being like so much more noble or complex or impressive in the time since smartphones, this sort of smartphone era. So like the only thing that really changed was our own expectation about how online and connected and reactive we would be like that changed, but it's not like, you know, for those of us who were old enough to remember, like being like, I was working on Gmail before the iPhone came out and it's like, you know, it was still like you could, you could build a product like that that was really complicated and we could manage doing our work without having to be online all the time. So I know it's possible. And I also know that, um, that there were distractions back then too. Like, right. you know, uh, back then most of the email distraction I experienced, it was on my computer. But when I was on the computer, it was hard to not get sucked into that stuff. It was hard to not get sucked into Facebook. But what's happened in the smartphone era is that those distractions have gotten more sophisticated and they've localized onto the phone. It's kind of like you have like a roadkill on the highway and like all the wasps in the neighborhood like kind of go to it. Like all that stuff is in the phone now. And that's the that becomes like the primary, like the nexus, like the beating heart of grabbing our attention is the phone. It's the best way to do it. So that's where all of like the notifications, all the push goes there. And that actually represents quite an opportunity now because if you say, I want to change things, I want to get more control over what's going on, you can make some changes with the way you use your phone. And the, the intensity level has not been ratcheting up on desktop computers. You know, Gmail is pretty much the same as it was in 2008. It, you know, it looks a little different. It's basically the same thing. It's not going to hook you in any more on the desktop computer than it is on the phone, but you can shut up, you can get rid of it on the phone. And then all of a sudden you're freed. You've sort of gone back in time in a really good way. And so the phone is a powerful lever. It's a powerful way to, to take your attention back, but you have to do something that people aren't talking about very much, which is make your own decisions, not just sort of wait for the tech companies to solve it for us. And I think that's the problem with the success of the narrative that the tech companies are to blame for this. And again, like they're not wrong and I'm glad people are making that argument successfully, but it's not enough. And if you want to have your attention back, you really do have to make some changes. And as you said, like some of the things can be relatively simple. They just have to add some barriers to the things that that distract you and get in the way. And for me, I'm someone who has like no self-control with the phone. Like I love the phone. I love if like, um, I, I, I love email and it, it sucks my life away a lot of times, but I love, there's also a lot of benefits to it. And so, and I will, I would check it all the time if it was on my phone. So I've, I finally yeah. reached this point where I realized I can't, I just can't have it on the phone. I have to delete the email account from my phone. I have to delete the email apps from my phone. I can't have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I can't have YouTube on the phone. I can't have news apps on the phone. All that stuff will be, it'll be in my head just a little bit all the time because I'll always know there's something on there that maybe is new, maybe is going to be interesting to me, and I just couldn't handle it. So for me, the phone has to be distraction-free. I delete all those apps, so there's this barrier to being distracted, and I would have to reinstall the app if I wanted to just kind of look for something to catch my attention. And 
What's left is actually an amazing device. If you showed up in 2005 with an iPhone without email and the web browser and the social media apps and everything, but with all of the other apps that are powerful tools, so maps and music and podcasts and you know, even like the weather app, you know, the reminders, Siri being able to sort of like set a reminder verbally and like have it work. Like, um, God, even the flashlight, like it's actually an amazing, amazing thing. The camera, I mean, the camera is the best thing. It's always like the thing they talk about when a new phone comes out. It really is like the leading feature on the phone. And we sort of think like, if we don't, if we don't have all we can eat, if we don't take everything, then we're not getting our money's worth from the app. And I know I've fallen into that trap. I've used sort of all of the capabilities as a way to convince myself that I should buy a new phone, which is what I really want to do each time a new one comes out. But the reality is that if you cut down like half of the stuff, at least for me, it's a much better experience. It becomes a tool and I have my attention back and I've confined the worst distractions to computers, which are not always with me. So I have now a ton of my day where my brain is free. And that's very powerful. A really good reminder. You're the second person. To, uh, I don't know if you're meaning to challenge me and listeners, but it, you know, I feel some sort of, uh, you know, after Greg McEwen was on, on the first episode of this season, he challenged me to take social media completely off my phone. And I did, and then I needed an app for work, so I have Facebook pages on there to post just for business, and that's all I've been using it for. But it just shows how prevalent the distraction is in this day and age that so many people are talking about it, that it it has become an issue. And would you agree that the main problem with all this is just we aren't as present as we once were in our daily lives? Do you think that's what it's causing us to do or something different because in my own life I've noticed if there's one thing that the phone has done is I'm not as present in conversations in my current reality as I once was it's funny I think it's actually very hard to say if it's worse it's more okay. visible because everybody has a phone and we can see what it's doing to other people when you're just like out in public or you're at a restaurant, you see somebody on their phone. And so I, I think there are always moments where I'm like, oh man, I know I'm doing that sometimes. But now that I see somebody else doing it, I'm like, gosh, I, I really, I don't want to be missing out on that moment. And the phone is a very visible thing. It's like, it's like everything is in the same format. Now everybody's got that same little rectangle in their hand and we can kind of see it. But uh, life has always had distractions. And it's part of our like built in, you know, defense mechanism like if i'm walking through the woods and there's a there's like a jaguar like <laughs> just rustling through the bushes like i need to be distracted well it's important sure. <laughs> i need to be looking for clues and looking for information all the time and ready to snap out of what i'm doing but you know i mean before smartphones there was still email on the phone there was briefly there was there's was a small window where social media existed just on desktops and not on phones before that there were still newspapers and i think the news actually is a huge source of distraction stress and taking our attention away from moments that matter that is very powerful and has existed for you know probably a little over a century maybe in this current form of like daily news like we really don't need daily news unless it's like an emergency but now we like not only have daily news but like hourly news and it's completely unnecessary it's completely insane and this is a powerful like emotional damage to us and so social media is a problem here but there are a lot of obstacles to paying attention. But yeah, they're more powerful now than they ever have been. But we're also talking about it now more than I think we ever have been. So we have a better chance. You might have a better chance in 2018 of finding a way to get control of your attention because the topic is out there, because we're having this conversation, maybe than you would have in 1958. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I know there were distractions in 1958, but um, but I think that... that they're more powerful now, but they're not, they're not insurmountable. That's a really good point. And um, yeah, I mean, I just think that, you know, like you said, it, if it wasn't this distracting us, it would be something else. So, I mean, you think it will get only worse, right? It's better to talk about this in 2018 than 2020. Well, the reason why we have to talk about it now is, and the reason why we can't wait for the tech companies to solve it, is that what's at stake is, is our lives. You know, yeah. Like, uh, it's easy to think of life as like, you know, some collection of a number of decades, a span of life, but that's not what life is. Life is experienced right now. Like at the moment that you and I are talking right now, 
this is the only moment that exists for us. There's only right now. And anything else is sort of a construction in our mind, a construction of our memory or our imagination about what the future might be. But there's really only this moment right now. So every moment when we can't actually be aware of what's going on, we can't have intention in what we're doing, but instead we're reacting to other people's priorities or other companies' priorities, or our attention is just frazzled because we've been emotionally bombarded by whether it's a news feed or the, literally the breaking news, we lose that time. We're losing a part of our life. And so if we wait and hope that, well, someday this will get better, someday people are going to solve it, we, we want to lose like a day of your life or a month of your life or a year of your life because more time went by in a blur. It's not worth it. You got you to gotta take control right now. And it requires looking at, we talk a lot in the Make Time book about defaults. There's these default settings. Like you get the phone, it already has email on it. You set up an Android phone, it requires you to put in, like you have to set up a Gmail account. It's crazy. <laughs> like you have to, you know, um, and of course we take for granted, whether it's an iPhone or Android, you're going to put your email on there, of course, because it can do that. But examining that default and actually email is insidious because we're all aware of the privacy concerns and all this stuff with social media. People are talking about that already. Email gets a pass for some reason. Like it's been around for so long. We just like are like, yeah, but email, I mean, it's obviously productive. It's obviously constructive. So, but it's, it's a huge problem. It's right on the phone. So we have to look at these defaults and I think say, what happens if we erase all of those things? What if it happens if you erase all those apps, feel what that feels like for a day and then start to like renegotiate the relationship from zero where you've taken all the bargaining power back. You're not saying, oh, thanks a lot, Apple, for giving me a chart that tracks my screen time, makes me feel more guilty. Or thanks a lot, Google, for doing, you know, doing the same thing. That's not enough. They shouldn't just give us a chart, make us feel guilty with a notification. We should say, screw you. I'm going to delete everything. Now prove it that it makes it better in my life because all this stuff just got like added bit by bit by bit, slowly turned up. And, uh, and we, we have all the power though. We have all the power over our own attention. Absolutely. And a good reminder that we shouldn't blame other people, other things. At some point we have to take responsibility and nobody likes the toughness, uh, found there. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, at the end of the day, it, we have control over our decisions, our lives. Yeah. It's a good reminder. We do. I mean, one of the things that's tough though, is that I think it's easy to feel like, gosh, well, I have to have willpower and resist these things over and over again. And I was going to ask I, you what willpower yeah. was to you. Do you believe in it? Do yeah. you think, what do you, I mean, what, well, I mean, certainly it's a, it's a thing. And there are times when, you know, you need to use willpower when you're establishing a habit or something, but willpower is not the way out of distraction. I, I have worked inside these tech companies and I'll tell you a couple things about them. One is that they're really good at what they're doing. Like they're really good at making these products as easy to use and compelling as possible. And so you can assume that that's for the most part, not going to stop. They're going to make some efforts to be more respectful and they should, and they do that. I'm sure they're doing that well-meaning, uh, not, you know, not maliciously, not half-heartedly they're doing it, but what they're really good at is making the products easier to use, more compelling to buy, because that's where all the market forces are. That's what these you know, folks like me are really good at. But the other thing is that they're doing this with the intention of bringing the future to life with making our lives better. So when you do something that like, honestly, inside the companies who are doing the best work, building the best products, there's a lot of joy. There's a lot of like wholehearted enthusiasm for the things that are being built. And if you've ever been to Disneyland, like, um, you know, you've, or, or watched a Disney movie, maybe like you've seen what happens when somebody does something wholeheartedly with joy. Like there's an attention to detail. There's a magic behind work that's done with joy. And that is in these products. That is in the Instagram app and the Gmail app. And it's in the iPhone itself, the construction of the device and the OS. There's a joy and a like real passion and craftsmanship that comes from believing in your work. So we're up against that, actually. Like if when that when that like conflicts with what we want to do, like we can't say, oh, they're hijacking us or oh, like they're malicious, like they're not malicious. And it's going to be always hard to resist because they're doing work that they care about. 
And these things actually, in many ways, are very beneficial to us. But it's because of that stuff, like, I don't think willpower is ever going to be sufficient. And even if Apple and, and Google decided, well, we don't even want to make money off of this anymore. We're just going to, like, we're going to ban all these apps or whatever. Like, something else will come up. And people will be passionate about taking our time and attention because people care about making great things. So the thing is, if you think about your own time and your own relationship with technology as a designer would, and you think, how am I going to design this so that it suits what I want, the purpose that I want? Forget about productivity and think about being purposeful. Then how do I want it to work? And you know, for me, it's about saying like, look, I'm going to delete things that I don't need, especially off of the phone. And, uh, and I have so little willpower and self-control that I have to have, you know, I have an app on the computer that shuts off my access to, to email during times when I want to write. Otherwise, I would do my email instead of write, even though I know writing is more important, the email is an easier path to this feeling of doing something. And so, you know, I think you have to design how you're going to use your time and create barriers to those endlessly appealing products that are out there. And when those barriers are there and you know what you care about, then the, the focus just appears. And this is something we talk about in the book, this idea of saying, you set a highlight for each day. What's going to be the one thing that I want to look back on the day, the moment that, that I really want to have enjoyed or be satisfied by? And then you sort of engineer the day so that that, that happens. And, um, and it, it does require saying, like, I'm not going to beat myself up. I'm going to stop feeling guilty. I'm going to just acknowledge that those products are super compelling and I need walls to keep them out. So what you're saying is we have Disneyland in our pockets and who wants to resist that? <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just appreciate your work. And uh, obviously a lot of research went into make time. And I appreciate it too, just... Uh, in the book, you not only touch on time management, but you also touch on ways to increase our energy, which is the other side of all this. Um, and, you know, even even if I feel like I have my time managed out, there are days that I don't have as much energy as I should. So I appreciated that as well. Um, and not as many time management books even talk about that. So I did enjoy that. So Make Time is a wonderful read. Everybody needs to go pick up a copy right now. <laughs> and uh, Sprint was a great book as well. But kind of wrapping up here, I ask my guests the same two questions here at the end. It could be something we've already touched on today. It could be something that we didn't get to talk about. But if there's one last piece of advice that you'd like to leave listeners with today, what would that be? Well, you know, I'm going to... Uh... I'm going to come back to something you asked me about in the very beginning that I think I never actually answered, which was, how's it, how's it going? Like the book is out. Like, what is that? What's, what's that process like of publishing uh, the book? And this will eventually get to the answer to your question just now. I'm going to try to answer both at, at once with a little bit of a, a story about the book coming out. So if anyone's ever thinking about publishing a book, I think one of the things that was fascinating to me is that you have to, fascinating and painful to me, you have to figure out how to market the book yourself. Like you, you will get help from the publisher, you will get help from your agents, and that help is expert professional help. It's great. But you also really have to figure out how to do it yourself. And the, the things that might make someone passionate about a topic and want to write a book about a topic and the writing of a book, those are totally different things than the marketing of a book, figuring out how to explain what, you know, we've explained over the course of 200 and some pages in a soundbite. It's really, it's hard to do and it's a different skill set. and going out there and, you know, figuring out how to, how to reach your audience and who to, you know, sort of pitch to and all these things is a whole different experience. And so right now, you know, you asked me in the beginning of maybe before even our podcast started, like, what's going on right now? And I was like, hey, look, the truth is this time for me is not a happy time. Like doing, I enjoy having this conversation with you, but what I don't enjoy is the time when I'm thinking like, okay, what's, what other podcast should I try to get on? Or what sort of blog post should I write to try to attract a few more listeners and try to, or, you know, readers to try to get some people to understand what's going on here? How do I package up? this what really is like a in a way you've we've been talking about it for an hour it's a it's a complicated topic how do i package that up into the headline that people will read and it's it's hard and i think it's very hard to get to the point where you are reaching people to the degree that you want to cuz probably no one does even even stephen king probably wishes he could reach even more readers uh, maybe he doesn't he seems like a pretty 
chill guy who's pretty yeah. uh, pretty happy with how <laughs> things are going. But but uh, <laughs> but I think for most people, even the people who have have reached wild success, they want to reach even more people. And I have been trying to remember this advice for myself, and I'm going to give it to your listeners. It's very self-serving right now because I'm hoping that people will buy the book. But when you have just written a book and you're trying to figure out how to explain it to people, I think what you can realize is that there's this disconnect between the headline and the, the content that's in the book. And so most of us, I think, read books. I personally will read a book when someone says to me, hey, look, I've, I've read this book. I think you might enjoy it. A personal recommendation is the most powerful thing. And then I think the next best thing is actually listening to an author on a podcast. And I can hear somebody talk about it for a while. But what's going on there is there's a lot of extra context. There's yeah. a lot of depth. Either there's a depth in my relationship with the person who's recommending it. And I understand that they know me and I know them. And so I think, okay, I'm going to make this investment in reading a book. Or there's this investment in time. Like I've, I feel like maybe I've heard something from the author and I think maybe that person will have something interesting to say on the page. But I think that over and over again in my own life, I make the choice to skim the headlines instead of reading the book. Mm -hmm. Like metaphorically or literally, like skim the headlines instead of reading the book. Like That's if so I, good. You know, I'm on, yeah. I'm on looking at like life hacks and like mm -hmm. 32 tips for the 32 things you should do before 3 a.m. every day, like kind of crazy stuff. And, and that stuff doesn't actually have value. Like it's almost, 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 almost never that I read something from a headline, from an article online that I actually then apply into my life. And I have a friend who said to me years ago, he's like, books are cheap. Like he was, I was surprised by how many books he had bought. And he said, yeah, I don't read all of them, but when I buy it and I actually like start to flip through it, when I do find something in a book that's valuable, it has all this depth and the cost of books, you know, even if I buy 10 books to get one powerful insight, I might've spent a hundred dollars, you know, or, or $150 and relatively that's pretty cheap if it's mm -hmm. a, if it changes my life in some kind of a, a meaningful way. But I can't really know just by reading headlines. And I think throughout our life, we're confronted with this choice and the easy path is headlines. And these are headlines in our email is headlines about work, but it's not the book about work. A lot of times doing email means I'm doing these small reactive things. I'm not digging in on the big important project that maybe is not quite as urgent. Maybe nobody's asking for, but I know if I dig in and push it forward, it's going to be really meaningful. It's maybe the thing that's going to help my career and help the company, you know, help me feel like my work has, has more value. Um, maybe it's with relationships, the headlines, those are the things that are in the newsfeed that attract our attention. Oh, here's the, all the updates from my friends, but that actually takes away from the book, which might be the actual in-person meeting with the friends, the actual, time spent on the floor with just doing nothing with my sons, you know, playing with Legos or, or wooden trains. Yeah. The headlines of the news, actually, if you're quite literally, like they take the place sometimes of us having more deeper understanding of what's going on, of reading the book about what's going on. So I think this choice between the headline and the book metaphorically is happening for us all the time. And if you can choose to go for the book, to go for the big thing, uh, you have to give up the headlines. There's a cost to that. You have to be a little bit less in touch with everything and you have deeper knowledge, deeper understanding, or apply a deeper focus to one thing at a time. There is great value there. And anytime something has happened in my life that I was excited about or cared about, and looking back, I think it was choosing that deep interaction, the book over the headline. I love that. That is so good. And uh, a good reminder for myself in talking about depth, I, uh, I didn't expect for us to talk this long, and, and I love it. <laughs> it. You might be my longest podcast ever, but it, it was so <laughs> it was such a natural talk. And um, I feel like I know you better. I feel like I have a new friend. Didn't expect Likewise, that yeah. either. So it's a bummer. I, you're in Illinois. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we're not even going to really be able to hang out except over, it, over Skype. Yeah. But next time you're in San Francisco, well, for sure. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. We could we could talk longer, but it, I guess at some point we have to cut this thing off. But uh, <laughs> the uh, listeners are like, oh so my much. God, when are they going to stop talking? <laughs> <laughs> I, I love it. You know, you know, people send me emails about podcasts and their favorite ones are the ones that feel like natural conversations. And I mean, all of them do in some sort, but a lot of times I'll focus more on the work that, you know, really stood out to me. But this one, it was just a conversation. And I think people will get more out of that and get to know you better and talking about depth, that whole intro where we were talking about your story and more context. They now know you 
a lot better, and, and I do as well. So thank you. Um, last question for you, Jake. Yeah. Where would you like to send people to find out more about you and your work? Yeah, I'll try to not spin this out into another 15-minute <laughs> answer. <but laughs> yeah. Well, if you if you want the, <laughs> the headlines, I guess, um, jakenap.com <laughs> has links to my books and um, some, you know, some of the most popular posts that I've written are, are on there. Um, and so that's a good place to go, jakenap.com. Um, another place you can go is if you want to hear more of me rambling and add another <laughs> podcast to your list, I, I do have a podcast about, it's about products and design. It's called Product Breakfast Club. And it is a conversation between me and uh, a friend of mine. And it is a lot of this kind of thing. Uh, it's, it's a lot of just talking around um, and occasionally a little, a little nugget in there. So Product Breakfast Club is the name of that podcast. So those are the two best places to go to find me. Awesome. And I'm going to go subscribe to that now so I can hear you uh, talk some more. So <laughs> that's great. Well, uh, thank you again for your time. And again, everybody go get this book. It's, it's fabulous. Ah, thanks, Adam. Appreciate it. Make time. Make time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for tuning in. I hope you got something out of these ideas. Go ahead and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. 